There are other types of plans that get used. And remember way back in one of the chapters, we talked about the lot and block system that would be a subdivision. Well, a subdivider is going to be someone who goes in and buys a hundred acre plot from a farmer and then is going to subdivide that acreage into smaller lots and hopefully make more money by selling 100 individual lots for more money than he paid for the 100 acres. He is going to have a plan on how those lots are going to be developed. You know, there's going to be a central road and there's going to be access roads and we're going to, maybe I should be doing this on a drawing, might be better. That always does that to me. You know, he's going to say, oh, well, here's my hundred acres and I'm going to build a road here. And then the access road is going to be just one big circle. And I'm going to put, you know, the retention pond back here. And I'm going to put lots here to sell. And in here, I'm going to have four bigger lots. And that would be the subdivision plan. And that would have to meet all of the density zoning. He may submit that back to the example and go, well, here's my plot plan to build those 50 homes that we talked about. And the municipality is going to say, no, we are not going to allow that because this is 10 acres and our density zoning is 2.4. You can only build 24 homes. Remember that example? There they are. And then he would submit that plan to get approved as a subdivision plan. They would be controlled by the state or local government. And they are going to set standards at a state level. And once again, a local government could set higher standards. So the state may say our density zoning is this and some local municipality goes, we want a more stringent density zoning so that we can reduce the population and in essence not have to put a new fire department in because now there are too many people. That plat map is going to show all of those boundaries that we just showed. Where are the lots at? Where is the sound swale? Where is the retention pond? And all of that must get recorded so that everybody knows where it's at. And using that is how we control the density where it talks about the maximum number of houses per acre. So we have been talking about the government or the man holding us down. We can actually do it to ourselves through private land use controls. These are restrictive covenants that may limit the use of the property imposed by a past owner. Remember those uh, fee simple defeasible? Maybe somebody has passed something on. And the example I gave in that chapter was we sold 10 acres to a seller, but one of the requirements was the buyer was not allowed to subdivide it and build homes because the current owner didn't want to live next to a subdivision. So he'd sell the property with a defeasance that, that said they couldn't subdivide it. That would be an example of the restrictive covenant that was applied on that property by a past owner. Or maybe it's the current owner that's going to do it and they're going to bind the future people down the road. So they could be in there on private. Now, there's some legal issues that I don't want to cover a whole bunch. Uh, basically, it's just talking about these restri restrictions have to be applied consistently. They can't be pre prejudicial. These restrictions can't be overly broad. 
And if they are in conflict with, say, like the municipality zoning, whichever the one is the most restrictive is the one that leads the pack. Okay. Um, enforcement of a private restriction usually requires a court intercedent called an injunction. So if someone's violating the homeowners association, they would file a court called an injunction to get them to stop doing that. And homeowners, let's go back up. Homeowners associations are another form of private land use control. You can't put a chain link fence up. You can't, you know, have an outbuilding. It has to be up touching the main structure. Um, and that's not a lie. Actually, one of the houses I used to live in, that was one of the rules. They didn't want sheds out in the yard. If you could have one, but they wanted it up attached to the property. So that would be another example of private land use controls. Okay. Now in this chapter, this is one of those chapters where they're like, okay, we, we, we got some stuff left over. Let's uh, throw some more stuff in. Well, this really has nothing to do with land use controls as far as I'm concerned. But we're going to talk a little bit now about real estate investing. Real estate investing, I actually came from the real estate investing world. That's what got me started in this. I was in the corporate world, had a corporate job until it got, the company got merged with another huge company and our jobs went away. I had already owned, my wife and I at the time had owned rental properties. So I was a real estate investor prior to me even getting my real estate license and prior to becoming a teacher. So real estate investing is kind of like my first love. But unfortunately, this book only has like three or four sections that deal with it. And mainly they want us to talk about what are the advantages of investing in real estate? So I want to cover some of the advantages in real estate. The most notable one that people think is there is a larger rate of return on rental property than there is on most other types of investments. Not necessarily true, but it is pretty good. Now, I do want to cover some math real quick because there are some questions that deal with this concept called a return on investment. And there is some math to figure out. And let me go through the example. Let's say you bought a house for 100000 and you sold it for 125000 The question is, what is the rate of return that was generated on this investment? So people get these confused all of the time on how they figure the math. And the math is, how much profit did we make as a percentage of what we put into the property? That is the key way to think about it and use it in your words. So what is the amount of profit that we made? 25K. And then people always forget or don't understand, which number do I divide by? Well, you divide by what you initially put in the property. In this particular example, it's 100000 So the return on investment in this case is 1 out of 4 or a 25% return on investment. You must use what you originally start with. So let's do another example just so you can figure. Let's say the person, and I'm going to make these numbers up, so I got to do the math with you. Let's say a person buys a property for 214000 and then they sell it later at 280000 That's the sale price, and this is the purchase price. My question is, what is the rate of return on this, or the rate of return on investment? 
That is the question. So what I want you to do is hit the pause button and do the math and we'll be right back. All right, so you're back. Let's do the math here. So the first thing we need to know is how much profit did we make? That would be the difference between what I sold it for and what I bought it for. And in this particular example, it's $66,000. That is the 280,000 minus the 214. And now to make it a, a return, I've got to figure out how much did I originally put into this deal. That will tell us which one of these numbers to use. So we would divide that by the original amount of money that I put in, which was 214,000. And when you do that math, you will get about 30% rate of return. All right. So the answer to this is what is my ROI or my return on investment is basically 30%. What I'm saying is if I had $214,000 and I was paid a 30% return on investment, I would make 66 grand. All right. That is how we calculate that return on investment. And one of the advantages is a higher than average return on investment. Another advantage that people like is the actual control. Now this one I will concede that people like. I own shares of stock in a company. Well, they say the shareholders guide the company, but dude, do you think my three shares of the 30 million that are out there really give me any say so? No, but in a rental property, I have a house and I want to repaint it tomorrow. Guess what? I get to repaint it because I have control over it. Now, obviously that control is limited based on what we've talked about in the above sections. You know, I can't go out and uh, paint it chartreuse green because that could be something in the homeowners that says I can't do that. There is just the pure appreciation of property. Remember the permanence of investment? We have talked about that land will always be worth more in the future. So what you get are these, there's the time, you know, you got your house that appreciates over time because land will always appreciate. Now you've got to be careful because there is an inflation in money that you've got to stay ahead of. So here's the amount that you actually earn. It's the difference between the appreciation in the property and just the inflation in general has gone up. So you want to make sure that the appreciation in that property outpaces the uh, inflation of the money. There is this thing called equity buildup equity buildup. We've talked about this in a previous chapter that when you owe this amount of loan, remember we had this drawing, and every time you make a payment, the principal balance on that loan goes down. So in essence, what happens is the equity builds up. So it's called equity buildup. Think about what real estate investment real estate really is. This is cool. I'm going to borrow someone else's money to buy an asset. That asset is then going to earn income to repay the loan that I borrowed. And if there's any extra loan or any extra money every month, then I get to keep that extra money. And every time I make a payment on that asset, I'm going to get closer and closer and closer to free and clear and own the asset completely outright. Get it? I'm going to borrow someone else's money, buy a rental property, charge them rent. That rent's going to cover the monthly house payment, plus it's going to give me 
a little bit of profit called cash flow. And every time I make a payment on that house, I'm going to get equity buildup because the amount of loan goes down and eventually I will pay the loan off and I own the asset free and clear while someone else actually paid it off for me. That's pretty cool. Another advantage is this thing called leverage. Leverage. Leverage is the use of opium, right? And we all know what that is. Other people's money. OPM. Other people's money. I'm going to leverage it. Now, in the residential world with homeowners, we actually use this term called lo loan to value. 80% loan to value. This is virtually the same concept, only in the investment world, they call it leverage. I'm still 80% leveraged. How much equity is in that? 20% equity. So in essence, what I'm telling you is for every $10 of buying power, I only had $2 into it. I leveraged $10 with $2. What's two as a percentage of 10? 20%, right? That's what I'm telling you. I bought a $100,000 house with only $20,000 down. I leveraged my 20,000 into a bigger number that allowed me to buy a $100,000 home. If I'm fully leveraged, what does that mean? That is 100% or 100% loan to value. So I literally have no equity, okay? So leverage is always great. So if you've got a hundred grand laying around, you could go buy one property and pay $100,000 and own it free and clear. Or I could put $10,000 down on 10 properties and still spend the same hundred grand. But now I've got 10 properties that are making income because of leveraging other people's money into allowing me to buy multiple investment properties.